Okay, welcome to another webinar by Grassroots Health. Scientists answer your questions. I'm pleased to announce Dr. Cedric Garland, who will be addressing the topic of serum vitamin D deficiency increases the risk of premenopausal breast cancer. And there we go, Dr. Garland. Hi. Hello. <laughs> We've got some great slides by Dr. Garland, and after which we will go ahead and answer the questions. So Dr. Garland, go ahead and, and take over. Okay. Well, thank you uh, for inviting me to do this webinar. It's such a pleasure. Uh, I feel like I'm very close to a number of you. Some of you are probably quite far away in different time zones. Uh, you may be in the middle of storms, you're in the middle of the night, but we're able to meet together in this way. Uh, this presentation is uh, largely of data um, assembled, collected, and analyzed by Sharif Moore. Uh, this was Sharif's, um, these are, we'll, we'll see mainly two papers that were presented as part of four papers that Sharif wrote for his doctoral dissertation from University of California, San Diego, and San Diego State University recently. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And we'll be talking about how serum vitamin D reduces the uh, incidence of breast cancer. But I wanted all of you to see how this got started. And it happened when the war on cancer was launched back in the 1970s. And uh, the National Cancer Institute was asked by the Congress to make maps of cancer in the United States because we're mortality. And when we saw this map, my brother Frank Garland and I, who were at Johns Hopkins at the time, we were stunned by the number of blue areas, which are the really low areas for breast cancer, in the southern tier of the United States, such as almost all of New Mexico, much of Arizona, much of Texas, and uh, the startlingly high rates uh, in the northeastern quadrant of the United States, and to a small degree in the northwestern quadrant. Um, because we knew that there was a lot more sunlight in the southern tier of the U.S. than there is in the northern tier, and a lot more um, and a lot less sunlight in the northeastern tier than in the northwestern tier, it fit the expectation uh, that we had exactly. We've been working on another tumor, and this one seemed to match it quite closely. So this led to us writing a lot of papers about uh, vitamin D and how it could prevent breast cancer, um, but ultimately. Um, those got tested. Next slide, please. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, one of the first places that was tested uh, actually was in the in the United Kingdom. And this was a test of the theory done by uh, Lowe and her colleagues in Bolson's laboratory in London. And uh, what they did was they found that, um, well, they got blood from people who had breast cancer and, and healthy controls. And they found that. Uh, as you can see from this graph, that uh, there was a 50% lower risk of breast cancer in women with 48 nanograms per ml of vitamin D in their uh, serum. And uh, this would be 125 nanomoles for those of you in Canada or Europe. And um, you can see that there was a pretty good dose-response relationship. In fact, the R squared shown at the upper right was 90%, which means that 90% of the breast cancer in London uh, in the study was accounted for by uh, vitamin D itself. That probably applies more generally to the London population. Another key point that I wanted to show you, besides the downward dose response relationship, is that it's how low it goes. Uh, if you look at about 60, maybe 62, 63 nanograms per ml, you'll see that the risk is down around a point, um, well, point two or so. So that means that they observed an 80% reduction in the risk of breast cancer with about 63 nanograms per ml. Next slide, please. So uh, as time passed, um, more and more people uh, got aboard and started to do studies to try to find out if it was true that it was really vitamin D that was making the rates of breast cancer lower in the southern tier of the U.S. And uh, we did a, a meta-analysis where we put two studies together, and we found that it, when two studies were combined, it was still approximately 48 nanograms with a 50% reduction in breast cancer. 
And as time went on, more and more studies happened. And here Sharif reviewed a, a whole slew of studies recently. And we find that that number just does not change. And it may be a property of strong biological relationships that while you occasionally see an exception, overall, you just keep getting the same number. Next slide, please. You can get the quote paper and read it yourself. But um, this is the latest meta-analysis we have in favor by Moore et al. in anti-cancer research. And uh, after all these years, uh, it's still about the same. It's projected at 47 nanograms per ml, uh, related to nearly 50% um, de decrease, 45 nanograms per ml related to a 50% decrease in risk of breast cancer. So it goes from 45 to 48 to 50 nanograms per ml across numerous studies. Uh, next slide, please. Needed to prevent half of uh, the cancer of the, of the breast. And studies typically haven't been divided up into premenopausal and postmenopausal, but we had the good fortune to really focus on premenopausal breast cancer in the present study. By now, I would say it's been established that vitamin D prevents postmenopausal breast cancer and specifically 80% of postmenopausal breast cancer. But there's still been some questions to whether it prevents premenopausal breast cancer. Uh, Abbas et al. in Heidelberg did this wonderful study that said that, yes, it does, but it all studies need replication. And it was a case control study, so we decided to do a cohort study. Fortunately, we had access to blood collected over the past decade or so uh, from women in the Department of Defense, active duty women in the Department of Defense. And um, what we found was that we located 600 consecutive cases of breast cancer and 600 controls who were matched to them uh, on the date the serum was drawn within a matter of a few days. And this just shows the basic facts of the case. Well, let's go to the next slide where we look at the results. And at first we were a little disappointed. We thought, well, it's nice that the curve is downward, but we'd like to have seen it more downward. But when you stop to think about it, it is a 40% reduction in premenopausal breast cancer in women at 50 nanograms compared to women down at uh, less than uh, 19, 0 to 19 nanograms. Um, and this is premenopausal breast cancer, which people had weren't as sure about as they were about postmenopausal. Next slide. But things looked up uh, in terms of the, the clarity of the relationship when um, the investigators limited the analysis to women whose breast cancer was diagnosed within 90 days of the date that their serum was collected. And there was about 125 of these. And what you see here is as the serum 25 OHD went up, uh, the um, risk of breast cancer went down. And it was so maybe 2.25 times greater risk at the high end of this scale than at the low end. Uh, and that means that, uh, well, it's a reduction by 55% in breast cancer risk. And what stunned us was the um, dose-response relationship. And you only see this line with the point so tightly along it when there's a mechanism that's uh, almost exclusively due to the factor. So this convinced us that vitamin D works very well in preventing premenopausal breast cancer, but it doesn't in a very short period of time. Next slide, please. And uh, this is for the non-white women. And it's, you know, as we went through the data, we were quite shocked to find that it was more dramatic even for the non-white women that non-white women who were down around 0 to 19 nanograms per ml had more than five times the risk of breast cancer during the next 90 days as people who were around 50 nanograms per ml. So if you happen to be non-white, um, this really applies extremely, so much so to you. It's an 80% difference in your risk of getting breast cancer if you're uh, below 50 nanograms per mil. Next slide, please. Uh, so how does this relate to theories? Well, the old theory, going back to 1902, is that breast cancer is due to mutations. Next slide, please. We don't actually any longer believe this is true. Um, but I'll tell you a little more about that. Uh, I will show you this one in the meantime, though, and this is a study done in Canada, which showed that women who had greater than 30 nanograms per ml 
of 25 OHC in their blood. They had a relative risk of 0.58, meaning that they had um, remarkably less, 42 percent less chance of dying with breast cancer than women who had less than 20 milligrams per ml. Next slide, please. So we developed a theory of breast cancer that does not start with any genetic event, but rather simply with the loss of tight junctions. And these are junctions that hold the cells together, make them adhere tightly to one another, and they send signals saying not to grow, and they also can share uh, nutrients through the um, junctional systems. And we believe that cancer involves E steps, starting with E for disjunction, which is the most important one, and the one that behind the D influences dramatically. And then initiation, much less important. Natural selection, very important. Overgrowth, it's just what happens as a result of natural selection. And the last three stages are uh, probably going to disappear once we get the vitamin D levels high enough. Next slide, please. So that's dynamite. And these are the little structures that hold the cells together. There are many kinds of them. But what they have in common is that they are all produced in response to vitamin D, which uh, enables synthesis of structures and proteins at 2,500 points on the human the genome. genome. Next That's slide. Right. And the way it works is and the way it works is uh, are held cells together are held together by hinges that look like this. Almost like a almost like a railroad. Uh, and, uh, and there's uh, and there's uh, it takes two it takes things. Two cat urine cat urine found up regulated by vitamin D uh, and calcium to right. make the cells stick together. Without either one, they don't stick together. Next. And uh, once uh, that uh, intercellular adherence is lost, the cells begin to grow. They compete with each other. Those that reproduce fastest and are most aggressive become greatly overrepresented in the, the compartment, the cellular compartment, known as the terminal ductal lobular unit in the breast. And they begin to eat away at the membrane surrounding that unit. And ultimately, one breaks through, uh, followed by others. Next slide, please. And that's the definition of cancer is when those cells violate that membrane, penetrate through it. Next slide, please. Um, but then later on, as the tumor is growing, and here the tumor is shown as a gray mass, um, it reaches a point where it can't grow anymore and will die if it cannot recruit a blood vessels. But um, when it reaches that point, uh, in someone whose vitamin D is very low, we see a release of a compound called VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor uh, F, that causes blood vessels to grow into it. And so if you can imagine little particles of VEGF being secreted by the tumor, and then uh, little arterioles growing up from that capillary. And that process is also under the control of vitamin D. When the vitamin D level is high, the little capillaries don't connect uh, to the tumor. The tumor eventually exhausts itself uh, through autophagy. The cells actually dissolve each other, and it turns into a small scar. And that's all that's left for the breast cancer if it can't recruit blood. Next slide, please. So that's the mechanism. And after all these years, since uh, actually this began in the 90s with the first realization that we know of, of the relationship between cell light vitamin D and breast cancer, with the same finding as Lowe et al. had at the very beginning. Namely, if you can get serum 25 OHD up to 48 nanograms, you'll cut the risk by half. And we believe that if you get it up to 65 or so nanograms, that you'll reduce it by at least 80 percent. Next slide, please. And science uh, tends to repeat things again and again, it would seem. But a good target for preventing breast cancer right now is 50 nanograms per ml. As time goes on, we're probably going to see this increase, but we always want the best balance between uh, efficacy and uh, knowledge of what adverse effects might be. And so <clears throat> if you're in a study place, um, in the world, in your fresh skin, your vitamin D levels can get quite high, anywhere from 54, usually up to about 70, but occasionally 90 nanograms per ml. And um, so those are safe. And 
we excrete 3,000, 5,000 IU a day of vitamin D. So any amount of vitamin D consumed at or below that level is going to be safe too. Next slide, please. So what we'll do here quickly is more or less summarize for you the, um, the things that should be done to prevent breast cancer. And if you have it, and what should be done. Next slide, please. Next. So we need vitamin D3, next. And uh, we're aiming for 40 to 60, preferably at least 50. If you're in the Europe or Canada, you see the values for you. Next slide, please. And oral intake is, is best determined by testing the blood and then giving the oral intake needed to maintain that level. Uh, but it's going to be at least 4,000 IU a day. Next slide, please. And uh, whenever you're taking a lot of vitamin D, it's good to take calcium with it, 1,000 milligrams or more, if you and your doctor decide it's needed to maintain bone density, and uh, keep up the fluid intake in order to prevent kidney stones, although we think the risk is very minimal, if at all. Next slide. And if you have already breast cancer or you have a patient with it, test their blood for serum 25 or HD, and um, if you're a physician, you may want to order calcium and ionized calcium. Next slide, please. And start patients with breast cancer on 4,000 IU a day and calcium, or vitamin D and calcium, regardless of what else you're doing, unless the patient is hypercalcemic. Next slide, please. And then titrate the vitamin D3 intake. Incidentally, it must be vitamin D3. You're more or less wasting your time with vitamin D2. Uh, titrate to maintain 50 to 60 nanograms per ml. Uh, at all times, and this means especially during the winter, but it should be all year long. Next slide, please. And um, you should retest the patients monthly uh, for the first few months to make sure they're off to a good start, and then every six months or so thereafter. Next slide, please. Should be an essential part of breast cancer management as, as a chemotherapy or a radiation. <coughs> And for some patients, particularly those who are not extremely fair-skinned, you could suggest that they spend 10 minutes a day outdoors near solar noon uh, with 40% of skin exposed. The skin exposure is a very important part of this equation. And with no sunscreen for the first 10 minutes or so, you don't want to always stay below the dose that causes the skin to turn thing. Next slide, please. And so we're back where we started. Uh, with the geography that led us down a long road over a period of, uh, gee, now 30 years or so uh, to where we are today with, and, and I can tell you with complete confidence, we are somewhere where we can prevent 80% of breast cancer if we can just get people's vitamin D levels uh, up all year long, all around the world, uh, to levels needed to prevent uh, both pre- and post-menopausal breast cancer. So I'm Thank you for listening. I'm ready for any questions. Okay. Well, thank you so much. That was a great presentation, Dr. Garland. Thank and you, I am man. going to switch to our question slide. Okay, great. So the first question, what is 25D doing to the normal cells to prevent breast cancers from forming and B, to cancerous cells to stop their growth? Well, you'd think it would be a long, complicated answer, but it's really, and so much of nature, very short. It's making the cells stick together. When they stick together, they don't compete. When they don't compete, there's no natural selection. With no natural selection, there's no evolution. And with no evolution, there's no cancer. So that applies to normal cells. And even to cancer cells that still have vitamin D receptors, vitamin D receptors are very robust. So um, most cancer cells, still cancer cells still have it. And it stops their growth by causing them to stick together. And when they stick together, they inhibit each other's growth. It was actually the first phenomenon discovered in carcinogenesis was that uh, the adherence of one cell to another inhibits the growth of its neighbor. And it's playing out after 100 years uh, through vitamin D. Okay, um, next question. What about deficiency and menopausal and postmenopausal breast cancer? I know you briefly touched on that, but could you expand a little more? Sure. Um, 
<clears throat> vitamin E deficiency produces breast cancer during the premenopause, during the menopause, and in the postmenopausal period. It's just that the effect is much more uh, rapid and immediate in the premenopausal period because the, the breast is being constantly stimulated by estrogen and progesterone in each menstrual cycle. And um, the growth is very fast. So uh, the growth is so fast even that under age 50, we generally speaking cannot catch it with a mammogram. And that's why mammograms are so ineffective. But the effect is just the same overall. It will be a 50% reduction with 48 nanograms per ml and potentially 80% reduction with higher uh, 25 OHD. Uh, it's just that uh, it, that plays out over a longer time span in the postmenopause than it does in the premenopausal period. Okay. Uh, next, what serum level of 25D is required to adequately reduce the risk of breast cancer? Well, right now it's 50% eliminates 50% of breast cancer. 50 nanograms per ml eliminates 50% of breast cancer. If we went up to say 65, the relationship is so linear that I believe that that would eliminate 65% of breast cancer. At some point, we'll be recommending that women go up to approximately 80 nanograms per ml uh, in order to reduce 80% of breast cancer. But the risks and benefits are still being balanced. But right now, it doesn't look like there's higher risk at those higher values. But we like to have consensus among the scientists. So right now, we're saying, well, let's get rid of at least half of it, uh, which would require 50 nanograms per ml. Okay. Are there different recommendations for women with breast cancer in their family history, or is it the same for all women? It appears to be the same for all women, but it is extremely urgent in the premenopausal period because uh, even short delays in starting vitamin D can be a period during which a tumor can evolve. It's a far more acute disease in the premenopausal period. So if, if someone has a family history of premenopausal breast cancer, they, more than anyone, uh, need to be starting vitamin D immediately. But it really does apply probably equally to all women. OK. Next slide here. Should I stop taking prescription vitamin D tablets if I have very dense breast tissue and have had an aunt who had breast cancer? <clears throat> well, to begin with, you, you probably should not be taking prescription vitamin D tablets because at least in the U.S., uh, almost all prescription vitamin D tablets are not vitamin D3. For some reason, they're vitamin D2 related to how the business works. And so yes, I would stop taking prescription vitamin D2 if that's where it is, and take prescription or non-prescription vitamin D3 tablets. And you should not stop because the dense breast tissue is dense. Uh, if anything, that would be even more of a reason to be taking vitamin D, or not stop because of having a family history. Both are, are all the more reason to do it. OK. Do we have any good data on vitamin D levels during treatment for breast cancer? Do we have any level that seems appropriate for women to take during chemotherapy? Uh, we have limited our patients to 2,000 IU per day during treatment. We sorely need such data. We don't. All we know is that women who have high vitamin D at baseline are 40% or so more likely to survive during the next decade or so but we don't have serial measurements, unfortunately. But most people, I think, would suggest at this point 4,000 IU per day for everyone, age 9 and older, male or female, during chemotherapy or not. OK. Next question. How do vitamin D, estrogen, and progesterone work together to reduce premenopausal breast cancer? Estrogen and progesterone pulses during the menstrual cycle are driving the evolution of premenopausal breast cancer. Vitamin D stops that evolution. Oh. OK. Next one. What range do you think vitamin D levels should be maintained at for breast cancer survivors? Um, well, I would say no less than 60 nanograms per ml. 
but it should be scrupulously tested so they don't get into periods when it, it dips down below 20 nanograms per ml, which can happen after a long winter or a time spent inside. Okay. I have had breast cancer twice in the past six years. Both were caught early and removed by lumpectomy. Besides increasing my vitamin D levels as a participant in the D-Action study, what are the most effective natural ways to prevent another uh, occurrence? Well, it's just exercise. It wants to get exercise, preferably on a regular basis outdoors, and avoid uh, drinking a lot of alcohol, no more than maybe one or one and a half drinks per day. Okay, thank you. What are the optimum vitamin D3 levels to avoid breast cancer? What if you have had early stage, what if you have early stage breast cancer? And can you slow or stop it by supplementing with vitamin D3? If so, how much should you take? And you may have already addressed this question. But. Yes, well, just to, to reiterate a little bit, um, we're, we're looking for 60 nanograms per ml in anybody who has breast cancer in the serum. That's going to be consistent with taking somewhere in the range of four to 6,000 international units a day of vitamin D, but it should be uh, tested. And can you slow or stop it? Yes, the data from uh, Canada suggests that um, having a high vitamin D is slowing the growth of breast cancer, so the answer would be yes. Okay, great. And Dr. Garland, I had a very interesting question come in. What about men? Uh, recently, I have seen an increase in male cancers. Um, it appears to be a completely different epidemiology in men, and it's sort of a conundrum. It's far rarer in men, so it hasn't received nearly as much attention. But we have no evidence to date that any of what we're talking about for uh, female breast cancer is applicable to men. Whatever's causing it in men seems to be a totally different uh, pathogenesis. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, and looks like we have time for one more question. Um, if you don't mind, Dr. Garland. Sure. My daughter started menstruating at age 10. At what age should women start taking vitamin D? Okay, they should take it in infancy, starting with the Thule of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, which is 1,000 international units per day, uh, the moment the girl is born. And then increasing uh, at the uh, end of the first year to at least 1,500 uh, IU per day, and then slowly increasing with each year of growth to a total of 4,000 IU at age 9. And it's very important for girls to get vitamin D, and ideally for them to get it beginning at birth. Okay, great. Well, we are approaching our time limits. Um, sorry, I'm sorry. And I wanted to thank everybody for attending today. Um, please tune in next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time to listen in on Dr. Susan Whiting, who will be discussing vitamin D levels are declining. However, MS, cancer, diabetes, and more on the rise. How can you protect yourself? Um, and you can register through our website at grassrootshealth.net forward slash webinars. And I want to thank you again, Dr. Garland, for your time and your information. Um, and thank everybody for listening in. And this concludes today. Oh, it was a today. pleasure, Jim. Thank you. And thanks to each of the, of the listeners and people who submitted questions for allowing me to come into your offices or homes and uh, chat with you about this. It was a great pleasure for me. Of course, and um, thanks to all the listeners from Grassroots Health, and please be sure to visit our website, grassrootshealth.net, where you can order your vitamin D test kit, and in doing so, you will join our D-Action program. Thanks again for listening in.